Well, praise the Lord, Community Faith. I am so happy to be with you today. It is Wednesday evening, and it is time for our Wednesday evening Bible study. Uh, we just started working through the book of James, and so today we're starting off in James chapter 1, verse number 9. I doubt we're going to actually make it through chapter 1 today, but we'll get through the next chunk. Uh, There's something great about the book of James, just how he is so meaty. Uh, in in the revelatory knowledge that he's sharing, uh, it is it's it's really not a lot of peripheral. Uh, it's very you know kind of to the point, um, and uh, he just lays things out that are very meaty, and you almost you have to stop. You almost have to take your time and just chew on this for a little bit, uh, and let it digest into um, our understanding. Uh, one thing about James is his book is very directive, so it's a lot about behaviors and actions and how to live, uh, things that we should be doing, uh, as well as the heart behind them. Uh, and so it's not necessarily a super theological book as far as the understandings, although. Uh, James does bring some of those things in. Uh, he is very heavy on uh, the command side and teaching us uh, this is how to live as a believer. And uh, this is all divinely inspired, written uh, by the Holy Spirit through the author James. And uh, so we went through a lot of that two weeks ago, talking about who James was um, as the uh, the brother of Jesus. And, and uh, so... Um, uh, you know, he's divinely inspired. He was uh, essentially known as the leader of the Jerusalem church. And so, um, you know, all of that, uh, you know, he was a very uh, weighty person in the New Testament church, very highly regarded, uh, respected, looked up to, and recognized uh, as a man of God that God had installed in his position. So uh, as we begin to tear into uh, verse number nine, here's where we're going to pick up. And so we talked a lot last week about the trial aspect. And so now he's going to to um, kind of bring that, um, well, I mean, it's a more of a continuation, I should say, uh, of that theme, but more brings in more practicality to it. Uh, and so in verse number nine, uh, we're going to start off, this is James chapter one, verse number nine. It says, now the believer of humble means, would, would meaning um, you know somebody who who's not rich or who uh, has you know humble means, has a, a humble home or uh, you know that that kind of thing. Um, you know, I wouldn't necessarily say poverty, but could be. Uh, but but certainly those that would be considered in the status of the time of humble means. He says they should take pride in his high position. But the rich person's pride should be in his humiliation, because he will pass away like a wildflower in the meadow. So there's a couple things that I think um, you know, are brought out here that uh, are worth talking about. One is the idea is, is that we're kind of all the same in Christ. So just like we would say to the unbeliever, this is the closest to hell they're ever going to get. And to the believer, this is, I'm sorry, to the unbeliever, this is the closest to heaven they're ever going to get. To the believer, this is the closest to hell we're ever going to get. In this regard, saying that, you know, to those of humble means, um, recognizing that you may be of humble means here on this earth, but that your position in Christ, there is none higher. And so uh, recognition that, that this is, you know, the, the highest place. Um the, the rich man may say uh, to the poor man, you know, he is going to his riches where the the rich man might say, I'm leaving mine behind. Um, the idea here is that the, 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 the place of the rich man is to glory not in his position, but to glory in his humility because that's the part that God um, is exalted in. And so he says, you know, the rich person should be in his humiliation uh, or should glory at least um, in his or have pride in his humiliation because he will pass away like a wildflower in the meadow. Um, so, uh, you know, verse 10, um, uh, you know, well, well, verse 9 basically 
he's talking about, you know, these material poor believers should find their joy focusing their thinking on, you know, spiritual riches and who they are in Christ, where the materially wealthy should remember that, you know, their riches are temporary and that this, uh, you know, it just, that's going to all fall away. You're not bringing any of it with you. So be careful what your life ambition is. Um, the, the pursuit is the pursuit of God and ultimately the pursuit of his will to accomplish the will of God in your life. And that's the thing uh, to take pride in. When you, re when you reach heaven, you want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Now, hey, wait, not, you know, hey, way to go. Uh, you really built some wealth for yourself, right? That, that's not, uh, um, you know, the goal is to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Um, so let's move on to verse number 11. He just elaborates on this a little bit more, but I think he's, I believe he's got both people in view here. And so let's look at it from that perspective. Verse number 11, for the sun rises with its heat and dries up the meadow, the petal of the flower falls and its beauty la is lost forever. So also the rich person in the midst of his pursuits will wither away. Um, so again, it's kind of grasping that understanding, catching that imagery um, in the uh, uh, in in Jerusalem or in the um, really in in the Mediterranean in that part of the world that kind of you know biblical era there. But but mainly he's he's speaking to uh, you know Jewish believers there. Um, so most of them have this understanding of uh, how there, when the grass is green, it's it's green for a season and then it goes brown, and that's the uh, um, you know that's the the idea of uh, you know the grass withers. Some versions say it that way, but uh, basically the idea of you know the sun dries up the meadows, just recognizing the seasons um, and uh, and understanding that none of this is going to last forever and that we're all going to move on. Uh, and so um, the other part of that, though, is I think, I don't think he's let go of the understanding of trials. Um, you know, our trials, as well as our triumphs here on earth, they're only temporary, right? All of these things um, is are, are going to pass away. And so whether, again, it be our triumph or it be uh, our temptation or our trial, um, both uh, we need to recognize that these these um, you know these trials are only going to last for a season. Um, but same with our triumphs. Let's not become too self confident um, in our triumphs, but recognizing that we always have a need for God because there's another trial uh, right around the corner, right? And we're going to need the Lord again. So let's not um, you know let let's not. Uh, you know, rally in our triumph and then say, well, I can beat it. You know, I got, I can, I, I can do anything. Um, I can do anything through Christ who strengthens me. That's where my humility lies. But in my own flesh, I've already proven, um, I'm not the most valiant. Uh, and so that, that really comes from that relationship with God and, uh, him, his ability to help us overcome. Um, so let's look at verse number 12, because now, uh, things are are kind of you know he he's shifting gears a little bit here. Now I wouldn't say shifting gears, but he's continuing the thought. He's he's moving forward in the revelation. And verse number twelve, he says, "Happy is the one who endures testing." So he's kind of back on this trial thing. Remember in verse number two, he said, "You know, count it all joy." Um, and so now you know when you fall into diverse trials. So now he's saying, "You know, happy uh, is the one who endures testing." Because when he has proven to be genuine, he will receive the crown of life. Now, this is a really big deal because now James is talking about specific reward. He's talking about the crown of life. And this was also referred to uh, in the book of Revelation. And so now we have, um, you know, the, the crown of life was uh, Revelation 2.10. He talks about uh, the crown of life. And so now we have this, you know, now he's he's talking about a specific promise. Now he goes on to say, we'll receive the crown of life that God promised to those who love him. Now that's also interesting um, because the assumption would be if you're a believer, you automatically love the Lord. But I don't know that that's necessarily true. We can put our faith and belief in Christ, but does that mean that we love him to the point that we put him first? Um, and that's really kind of the test of love uh, is that we would put him first and that, um, you know, we, we live life in that view. Kind of goes back to what we've been talking about on Sundays, right? Whose story are you and whose movie are you in? Um, that, uh, you know, we, we understand 
that he is the center. That's that comes from our love for him, and uh, and so he's talking about this crown of life that uh, as we endure testing, basically enduring it because of our love for Christ. That, that if you put it all together, he's saying the 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 drive, the passion, the motivation that we have uh, to endure testing, to overcome sin, uh, to you know call upon God, submit to God, resist the devil. And he flees from us to uh, to overcome trials uh, and challenges that come in life. To uh, that it, it is our love for God that keeps us pursuing Him in the midst of those things, uh, and not just you know uh, a fear that you know something bad might happen to us, uh, but truly out of our love for God that that would result in the crown of life. Um, and so this perseverance uh, through love is is rewarded with this crown of life. Now, there's a few other crowns that the Bible talks about in the New Testament, um, and the crown of life is one of them. It is for enduring trials. We read about it here in James chapter 1, um, and then, like I said before, also in Revelation 2.10 is where you see that crown of life. Now, there's a couple other, though. Um, you may have heard of the imperishable crown. Uh, that was in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, um, which uh, was is basically for leading a disciplined life. See, these are all rewards that are given to believers um, for living out our Christian life. Uh, these are the things that we're, as we're judged uh, on Judgment Day, as, we're, as Christians, we're not judged to condemnation. Um, you know, we're already been judged to life because of Christ, uh, but we're judged for reward. And uh, and so these are these rewards that are handed out. Um, and there's an imperishable crown for those who lead a, a disciplined life. Uh, there is the crown of rejoicing, um, which has to do with uh, sharing our faith and um, in discipleship, walking in discipleship. Uh, you can read about that one in uh, First Thessalonians two. Uh, you'll read about the um, uh, the crown of rejoicing. Uh, there's also the crown of righteousness. Um, and uh, those are the crown of righteousness is for those that are pursuing uh, the coming of the Lord. That we're not just trying to hold up our shield of faith and make it through, but that we um, uh, it's it's for those that are that are longing for um, and uh, you know for for uh, uh, loving the Lord's appearing, pursuing the Lord's appearing. So that's in Second Timothy chapter four. Um, you can read about the uh, you know that particular crown, um, and then the, the other one that's mentioned is the crown of glory. Um, the crown of glory is one that's given to elders. It's the only one that we see uh, that isn't necessarily. I, I, it's hard to say, but it doesn't seem like it is kind of a um, available to all believers. But this one is for uh, those who are elders in the church for shepherding God's flock faithfully. That um, those who uh, faithfully uh, gave themselves to shepherding of the flock of the Lord would receive this crown of glory. Um, and you can read about that one in 1 Peter chapter 5. Uh, so, so those are some of the different crowns. And so James um, explicitly brings out this particular crown, which is interesting because this is the one crown that's mentioned in two different locations. And um, Revelation would have been written after the book of James, uh, but it's interesting that it's brought up in Revelation, which again uh, leads to the divine inspiration of this book. Um, but uh, also because John's revelation, he literally just wrote down what he saw and what he heard. Um, so it's not like he was uh, revelating in these things and sharing them. He was writing what he saw and writing what he heard. Uh, so this promised crown of life is mentioned later in the book of Revelation. Uh, so very interesting. So, you know, it's uh, a great um confirmation to us that this is very real. Uh, verse number 13, let's move on, let's continue in this revelation. Um, so now he's shifting gears and he wants us to understand, um, because when we talk about, hey, count it joy when you go through trials, count it all joy, uh, you know, when you work through temptation and all these things, that, that you know, somehow we might think, well, God's the one then that's putting these things on us, that God is uh, wanting, uh, you know, is is basically uh, wanting us to be tempted and, and uh, wanting us to go through these difficult times because, you know, after all, he's maturing us. And um, 
and James want, recognizes that that might be going through some of our minds. Um, and then all the more, you know, I, it, it can lead to weird thinking. Um, and so James wants to nip that right away. Uh, you know, it's like, again, by divine inspiration, he recognizes uh, some minds may be running in this regard. And so let's, let's capture that and let's talk about it. And so in verse 13, he says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil and he himself tempts no one. So, um, again, James doesn't want us to walk away thinking that, you know, that, that, that the Lord is the source of temptation. Um, but it's more like God permits us to go through temptation or permits us to go through these experiences of trials. Um, but he's not the source of it. And so, um, uh, you know that, and that's the idea. It's it's more like um, how uh, how a parent would allow their child to grow up. Um, we we as parents recognize that there's an appropriate age when we need to start letting our kids experience different things. And the hope is that they will make a good moral choice when they face those things because they're inevitable in life. They're going they're going to face them, and so. Um, you know, it's it's more like that kind of an idea that not that the parent themselves is the tempter and would tempt their children and then say, you know, which one are you going to choose? Uh, and then whack them if they make the wrong choice. But it's more letting them go out and have experiences that help to mature them. And that's really the idea. And that's really what James is saying, that these trials, these things that we go through, that as we work through them, we are matured through them, um, you know, primarily as we begin to overcome them and find uh, ways to overcome them in Christ and make good choices and work through these things, that it's maturing us, it's building us up, and it's strengthening us as strong pillars of the faith. And so these are all things that uh, uh, that is you know that that are kind of in view here as we're talking about this. Um, so he continues in this vein of thought, verse number fourteen, um, and he says, "But each one is tempted when he's lured and enticed." by his own desires. Um, so now he's, he's, he's beginning to show us, you know, here is how temptation works. And over the next few verses, he's going to work through that with us. Uh, this is how temptation works. This is, you know, not, to me, knowledge is power. Um, and so it's good for us to understand, have understanding how these things work, but to also recognize this is not God doing this. God is not the one who is our tempter. God is not the one who brings these things before us. But we do have some enemies that are. And uh, James doesn't bring it up here, but we we read read about that in First uh, uh, John, I believe it is. Um, you know, basically, it's the flesh, the world, and the devil. These are our um, uh, Peter talks about that as well. So basically, though, these are our our primary enemies um, that we have, and we see that thread throughout the New Testament. Uh, these three primary enemies: the flesh, the world, and the devil. And so um, that is really where the origins of these temptations come from. Uh, but uh, James is going to explain to us why it affects us differently. Maybe one person isn't affected by and they're not tempted by something as another one is. But in verse 14, he says, But each one is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desires. Um, so uh, um, in this case, the word uh, desires here is talking about... Um, Lust. Another, in fact, I believe some translations use the word lust there, uh, and lured and enticed by their own lust. Um, it's kind of the the negative connotation of desire. We can desire things that are good. Obviously, we can have a desire for God. Uh, we can have a desire for our spouse, a desire for our family. Uh, there's lots of good desires in life, but this particular Greek word here, um, it is uh, it's translated desire, but it's desire in the negative meaning. Um, and so it, it can be translated lust as well, uh, typ typically meaning of, of the carnal nature or the fleshly nature. Um, it's a, you know, a fleshly desire or fleshly passion. So in verse 15, then, he, he continues to expound on this. And he says, then when desire conceives, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is full grown, it gives birth to death. Okay, so now he's kind of getting real here, right? 
Um, and so the point of verse 14 is this is where to catch it. This is where uh, we can uh, address it and deal with it. And is the place to deal with it. You know, if you recognize that you have certain temptations, certain things in your life um, that are, you know, carnal desires, then we need to call upon the Holy Spirit to teach us to essentially lift up the standard against the enemy, whatever it is, the flesh, the devil, or the world, that is able to push those buttons to bring up that desire. So what can you and I do to set up protections against that, uh, right? So what are what are the things that we can do? And, and that's caught up in that verse 14 there is this is where to beat it because verse 15 says this is what happens if we don't. When desire conceives, it gives birth to sin. So if we don't nip it at the lust point, um, which, you know, nobody's judged for, for having a lust. We're judged for how we deal with it. That's what the challenge is here. Um, and so when we, when we face that lust, um, and especially the more that we're aware of it, the more we have a responsibility then uh, to work with the Holy Spirit and to devise a plan uh, to protect ourselves from falling into these diverse temptations. Uh, and so... Uh, that's really what this is. What this is talking about is essentially have a plan. Um, you know, that, that's my, you know, my pastoral wisdom to you in this. Uh, have a plan. If you know you have certain issues, have a plan. For God's sakes, have a plan. I see so many people that consistently kind of beat their heads over the same thing. And the question is, well, then what's what's your plan? What are you doing to protect yourself from falling into this temptation? How can you keep this temptation at bay? Um, if I know I have a specific lust for something that is going to get me into trouble, that's going to move down this road, that's going to give birth to sin, and again, sin when it's full grown gives birth to death, uh, which is what we read in the book of Romans as well. The wages of sin is death. Uh, when it's full grown, that's where it ends. Uh, it's its full maturity. Um, so let's deal with it uh, when um, you know when we're able to address it a as lust, and let's protect ourselves from that. Um, so uh, you know, I, I can tell you when I was uh, uh, when I early in my Christianity. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a man, so I like girls. Um, and, uh, you know, before I was a married man, especially, uh, you know, I, I, my eye was always, you know, looking for the right one. Um, but, uh, you know, there was also a, a carnal, you know, lust that came, that, that desire. And I would recognize there were certain things that would trigger it. Um, and, you know, I was looking for ways to build up a, uh, a safeguard, if you will, against those things. Um, and I've told this story before. If you've been in other services with me, you've probably heard me say this at some point or another. Um, but one of those things that, that I did was when I would get into the checkout aisle at the grocery store, there were all these magazines there. And, you know, they were, a lot of them had kind of risque covers. And I recognized that that was a trigger for me. That that was something that that uh, became a something that would kind of arouse that lust, and so I recognized why well, I, I want to address that. So I would start turning all the magazines over, and some of them I found the picture on the back was worse than the one on the front, like the Sports Illustrated swimsuit edition is a great example. Uh, the one on the back was worse than the front, um, and so uh, I was like, ah, you know. So then I started doing the taking the good housekeeping or some crap magazine and I just took that one and I covered them all up with that so the whole rack was just the good housekeeping magazine but you know that's one of those things I'm sure it drove the clerks nuts and they had to fix it all the time but it was one of those things that helped me to overcome that temptation or something that would arouse that lust I mean nowadays I you know I, I wouldn't say that it's uh, I give it much attention at all I actually spend more time uh, looking at the gum and candy aisle on the other side that's the new temptation I gotta figure out how to deal with that one um, but but, uh, uh, you know, but, but again, you have to start learning how to set up these standards to protect yourself from these known lusts um, or in whatever that may be. So, so, you know, it could be a food thing or whatever. Um, but whatever these carnal lusts are, we want to address them. 
So uh, let's move on to verse number 16. I know this is it's hard because I'm, I'm telling you, every concept James brings out, it's so meaty, you could preach on this. I mean, there's so many other supporting scriptures that give a lot more of the theological side of it and, and things like that in other books, but James just kind of gets right to the stuff, right? Um, and uh, it's almost like a catechism for new believers. Um, anyway, verse number 16. So let's move on. So now um, he is... He He's, you know, wants to shift gears and say, now listen, don't recognize that's where that came from. That's what verses 14 and 15 were about. This comes from inspired or, or a triggered uh, by triggers from the world, the flesh and the devil. And so he's saying, don't, you know, let, let's not, let's not get into that. Let's recognize who God really is. He's not the tempter, but who, who he really is. And so he goes on in verse number 16 now, and he says, do not be led astray, my dear brothers and sisters, all generous giving and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the father of lights with whom there is no variation or the slightest of change. So um, verses 16 and 17 here, he's saying, listen, don't be led astray. Don't, don't be, don't, don't let the enemy or other people or your own thoughts begin to deceive you and be led astray to believe that God is the one um, who is up to this. Um, Constable says it like this, James now defended God before those who doubted his goodness or reliability or had given up hope in a time of testing and had concluded that this was just their fate. Um, right. That's, that's not us. This is not our fate. Um, defeat is not our fate. We're not fatalists. Uh, God's desire for us is to be overcomers more than conquerors. Uh, God's passion for us and his, uh, his, uh, equipment. And he's equipped us with Christ Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the Word of God and, you know, all of these things, the anointing of God. He's given us all of these things and equipped us with these things to be overcomers, to be more than conquerors, not to be stuck in, well, this is just my lot. This is just my fate. Uh, this is the, the, the hand that was dealt me. Um, you know, we can, you know, we, we can conquer in Christ. God can take whatever hand you have and make it supernatural. And so he's saying, "Don't be led astray, astray my brothers and sisters. Uh, this is not this is not the end for you. Um, but uh, God has purpose, and God has a way to deal with these things. And so let's lean on that. So verse number seventeen. Then um, I'm sorry. Verse uh, yeah. Verse verse. Where am I? Um, yeah. Verse number sixteen. Don't be led astray. Verse number seventeen. All generous giving." And every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variant, variation or slightest hint of change. So where does the good stuff come from? Now the first part of this, all generous giving, meaning that the very spirit of giving comes from God. That does not come from the enemy. It is, it is the very portion of our God nature. We are made, all made in the image of God. That is one of those reflections of the very image of God within us, uh, that all generous giving. Now people can give with impure motives. People can give with, um, you know, different types of motivations to manipulate and so on. Um, those obviously are not coming from from God. Those are those are coming from more of our fleshly nature that's trying to manipulate and so on. But all generous giving, which is the no strings attached. I am I am releasing no strings attached. That's that's what God wants to make us. Generous people, giving people. Um, that uh, generous giving, he says, all, that comes from above. Um, and every perfect gift uh, comes from, you know, comes from above. The, and, and we're going to get into this perfect gift that he has in view, because ultimately he's talking about Jesus here. You'll see that in a second. Uh, but he's talking about how uh, the very gift of Jesus coming and giving his life for us, uh, that that's all in view here. And, and he brings that out, out even more uh, in the next verse. But he says, for every perfect gift is from above. Now the word from above 
Uh, the Greek word there, um, anothem, is the is the Greek word, but it, it it's the same word that Jesus used when he was talking to Nicodemus. Remember when he was telling Nicodemus that he had to be born again? Uh, the word again there that's translated again, it's the same Greek word, anothen, that is from above. Um, and so that again um, realizes or brings that recognition that the good gift that he's talking about, these give good gifts that come up from above, um, that it all, it is all tied up in Christ, uh, that God is ultimately the one who gives coming down from the Father of lights, which everyone recognized, you know, he who put the stars in the skies, uh, if you will, the, the, the creator of all. Uh, this is the good and no strings attached, generous, loving God um, who gave and uh, gave himself actually ultimately for us. Um, and he goes on, with whom there is no variation or the slightest hint of change. God is always a giver. It is his nature. And so, uh, you know, it's 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 part of who God is. So if you take that away, he ceases to be God because it's actually his nature. It's what he does. It's not just what he does. It's who he is. Uh, so that leads us to verse 18, which I think we're going to wrap up here today. So let's let's look at verse number 18. And this is where, again, he kind of really brings this uh, to light for us. So verse 18, for by his sovereign plan, he gave us birth through the message of truth that we would be a kind of first fruits of all he created. Um, so there is some nuances here that I want to bring up. And the first one being that it is his sovereign plan. He's again talking about how he is a gracious giver. Um, he gave graciously. It came uh, from you know this generous giving, which is a spirit of grace, no strings attached, that God, um, God's plan of salvation is a gift by grace. This is important for us to understand because later in chapter 2, uh, James is going to talk about some works, and uh, some in the body have used that to say that salvation Salvation comes through works, um, and and here in uh, chapter one, he's making it very clear that the salvation came through grace. It was a gracious gift that God had given us, um, and so this is you know truly showing us that he believes this eternal life alt uh, is is a gift of grace. It comes from God's grace. Now let's talk about this first fruits part though, because that's interesting. Um, and I believe he's attaching this to everything else he's been talking about in this chapter, and that is those that endure trials, count it all joy, walking in maturity, receiving that crown of life. These are these are those who you know who kind of worked through that um, and uh, have received this crown of life, you know that kind of thing. That James is saying that that's where it's at. That's the life to live: the overcoming, conquering over, calling on God, and enduring trials and temptations and working through those things and maturing through them, um, that it supercharges us and gives us uh, strength and maturity and, and um, you know, perseverance and these things that come from us working through them, that uh, these are all good for us. And um, what I what I believe he's doing here is he's kind of pulling that together, and he's he's not off topic. He's not changing topic and saying carte blanche because all of us that are born again are going to give glory to God through the new birth. But he says that we would be a kind of first fruits of all he created. This word first fruits probably refers to these Christians who um, persevere who make it through in spite of the trials, uh, in spite of the temptations, they continue to persevere through and conquer over those things. Um, you know, all believers are going to bring glory to the name of Jesus, but these faithful believers who, um, uh, you know, who pursue him that way, um, they are they, they bring a special glory to Christ, both in this life and the life to come. Uh, which is why they're given this crown, this special crown, uh, for the life to come. We don't wear it here. Um, and, uh, you know, some believe that we're going to cast all those at his feet anyway. But um, so, but, but just to, to show you this, cause, and why I, I really see it this way, uh, the Greek word for first fruits there, um, aparash, it, it, it refers to uh, what is 
in first honors or uh, what is first in order. And it is, um, you know, biblical writers in, in other places where we see this word used, it's often talking about superiority or persons of excellence um, that are of, of excellence above but in in the same class so um, these are these are those that excel they're they're of the same class but they excelled and I think that's what James is getting at here is that we're believers we're all going to heaven but this is a group that excels and that 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 group that excels is this first fruits group that is going to receive this crown of life. That's pretty cool because that also builds within us. Um, there is an incentive and there is a way that we as lovers of Christ can truly please him and bring a, um, you know, I understand there's a carte blanche ple pleasure that God gets by extending his grace and delivering us from the curse of sin, but there's an even greater, um, uh, I don't know what what's the right word to use there, but an even an even greater sense of um, I don't want to say love because that's not true. There's nothing we can do to make God love us more. Um, but there's a pride of of God or a a um, uh, you know a a uh, a willingness that God wants to reward that God God is is maybe I don't know if impressed is the right word, but you know he's he's delighted in it. He rejoices in it. Um, it it brings him great joy as we conquer over and overcome trials and and allow that maturity to come into our life and all those things that James was saying um, as this kind of first fruits uh, that that's a really cool um, really cool way to see that and so um, so as we kind of wrap up this portion again I'll read one more time from Constable here he says the point of uh, these verses um, seventeen and eighteen here seems to be that God's intention for all people, and believers in particular, is invariably their blessing. God wants to bless us. Rather than viewing temptations to depart from the will of God uh, as heaven sent, we must see them as the potential enemies to our spiritual growth. So again, rather than looking at trials and temptations, um, the, these these trials that come to try to get us to depart from the will of God, not to see them as coming from God, but all the more to recognize that these are things that are potential enemies to our growth. And God wants us to continue to grow and become these first fruits. Um, so that's pretty exciting, actually. I, I, I like seeing, I like how James kind of brings out these points that there is greater reward in heaven. Um, there's other verses throughout the New Testament that support that as well. Um, you know, Again, the whole concept of the Bema Seat Judgment is all about you know where uh, where we lie in regard to our our status of life and our our position in heaven. Um, that there is reward for you know God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Right? I mean, it's not just here on earth so that we have more comfort here on earth, but it's through our diligent seeking. God is a rewarder; He will lift us up. Um, when you read the the story of the talents, you know the guy who had the most talents who made the most off of it, um, God rewarded him because he did something with what God gave him, and he gave him a higher place, a higher seat. Uh, and so those, you know, we, we do see that there is, um, you know, grace doesn't cover everything and make everything null and void, and we're all the same. Um, there really is uh, a, a passionate pursuit in discipleship that is rewarded, um, and it's greatly rewarded. And so, uh, you know, that, that's a really big deal. Uh, and, and so I just want to encourage you in that to recognize um, that the criteria is here. Uh, but that these are rewards that God wants us to grow in. And so uh, let me just encourage you that today. Um, you know, and anything that's trying to attack that, it's coming from the enemy. Uh, he either wants to, he, what he'd really like is to take you out and make you ineffective. Um, but ultimately, uh, you know, he's, he's going to have a hard time doing that because the Lord has inscribed you on the palm of his hand. Uh, but he wants to make you as ineffective as possible, um, you know, if he can't steal your soul. Uh, so, but God wants to make us incredibly effective on the earth. And so that is his plan for us. That's why we're still here. And why we're the church uh, is to evangelize and to teach others and to make disciples. Uh, that's, that's what we do. So, all right. Well, God bless you. Um, if you noticed, I'm in a little different spot here today. I'm actually in Colorado. This is my last day. I leave tomorrow. 
tomorrow. So I'll be with you on Sunday. Uh, but uh, I was hoping to get somewhere where I could get mountains in the background and all that kind of stuff. But it, I'm telling you, it's the craziest thing. So two days ago, it was 93 degrees, and I mean, it was hot. I went to my sister's wedding, and I was wearing a black jacket, and it was outdoors. And I mean, we were roasting. And by the time the wedding was over in the evening when we left, it was, I mean, the temperature was dropping. It went from 93 to 39 degrees the next day, and it's been snowing all night. And you can't really see anything outside, but I couldn't really go anywhere because... I only brought a sweatshirt. I didn't realize it was going to be this cold. Uh, so it's hard for me to go sit out somewhere. And I was thinking I'd have a nice sunny day and could sit at a park and have some mountains behind me. But unfortunately, that didn't work out. So um, I will try to and see if I can. I'll open this window. You might be able to get a glimpse of the snow if you care. Um, but I'll try that real quick. And... Uh... All right. Can you, let's see if the, can you see this? Look at that, snow on the rooftop over there. <laughs> so uh, crazy days, crazy weather, um, but uh, there we go. But uh, praise the Lord. I'm glad uh, we were able to connect this way. And uh, I'm grateful that you're my friends and that you'll let me just open up the window and I don't have to be super professional like that. Uh, but uh, I do love you. I am so grateful for you. I know you're an overcomer. You're a conqueror. You can do this. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. And uh, he has plans and, and great things in store for us and has great reward, not only in this life. This is minuscule, the things that we experience here. Um, let me ask you, how long is this life compared to eternity? Uh, and so the quality and status of your life in eternity is going to be huge. Uh, and it's not going to be a U-Haul of stuff that you bring from here. Uh, so praise God for that. And so I just want to encourage you in that today. I pray that, that uh, James' words uh, had encouraged your heart today. And uh, we'll dive in next week and we'll dig a little bit deeper down. We'll get through chapter one next week. Um, and then uh, when we start getting into chapter two, again, it's pretty meaty stuff. And so we'll, we'll work through it. But I love you. I call you blessed. I will see you Sunday morning. All right. Be blessed. See you soon.